we think about often, and one that today's world expects us to be comfortable with. The challenge, however, is where do you begin, and how do you develop the mindset and skill set to be successful? Welcome, everyone, to the Sprint to Success with Design Thinking podcast. I'm your host, Saba Kidwai. Join me each week as I share the stories and strategies from the world's leading researchers and practitioners about why they believe the answer lies in practicing design thinking. That's Jim Maroos, one of the most influential people in the banking industry and host of the Banking Transformed podcast. He is my role model when I think about navigating the GPS of my career. 2020 has brought more unexpected turns than any of us could have ever imagined. And understanding the tools and strategies available to adapt and navigate this new landscape will really be the difference in speed between say, using your phone to navigate to a location or pulling out an old school paper map. Having just graduated from my doctoral program two weeks ago, I've been reflecting back a lot on my experience. I seem to pick really interesting times to go to school. I graduated during the last financial crisis back in 2007, 2008, and here I am again as a new graduate during coronavirus time in 2020. So I've decided to dedicate this week's episode to not only all new graduates, but also those who are currently struggling in their current situation and thinking about how to find new opportunities. One of my goals in going back to school was to gain a deeper level of empathy for what it's like to be a student today. I spend a lot of my time advising and speaking about what school should and could be, and I had a really deep desire to experience the things that I was speaking about and actually experience them, have an opportunity to try them and put them into practice. I was specifically inspired by a line from Tony Wagner, today's world doesn't care about what you know, Today's world cares about what you do with what you know. And really in being able to apply what I could do with what I know was where the idea for the podcast came from. In each episode of the podcast, I ask one of my guests to share advice with new graduates. This week, I've curated some of those pieces of advice. And as you listen to these excerpts, I want you to reflect on your story, your own journey as to how you've gotten to where you currently are. I'm currently reading Life is in the Transitions, Mastering Change at Any Age by Bruce Feiler, and I'm going to share an excerpt that highlights why how we tell our story matters such a great deal, and not only how we tell it to others, but also how we tell it to ourselves. At the very beginning of the book, he says, stop for a second and listen to the story going on in your head. It's there somewhere in the background. It's the story you tell others when you first meet them. It's the story you tell yourself when you visit a meaningful place, when you flip through old photographs, when you celebrate an achievement, when you rush to the hospital. It's the story of who you are, where you came from, where you dream of going in the future. It's the high point of your life, the low point, the turning point. It's what you believe in, what you fight for, what matters most to you. It's the story of your life. And that story isn't just part of you, it is you in a fundamental way. Life is the story you tell yourself. And here's where it gets really interesting. He says how you tell that story is important. Are you a hero, a victim, a lover, a warrior, a caretaker, a believer? How you see yourself matters a great deal. How you adapt that story how you revise, rethink, and rewrite your personal narrative as things change, lurch, or go wrong in your life matters even more. 
So this week, like I said, I've curated some of my guests' responses into one place in hopes that as you listen, it will spark an idea and maybe give you the inspiration and hope that you need to reflect back on your own story and how you tell it, despite how bad the current situation may currently seem. It really is the ultimate time to find and be found. That's right. Find and be found. That's what I believe the mantra should be for every student in today's world. Really not even every student, really every person. Find what you love and the people who inspire you and the places you want to work and the problems you want to help solve and be found. How will you share what you know so that others can find you as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, LinkedIn really over the past few years has just gone bananas uh that might be a uk thing but i mean gone crazy uh what what i'm finding is originally maybe five years ago when you saw someone at work go on linkedin you started to say hey um jennifer are you are you looking for a new job is that why you're on linkedin and that has really changed over the last few years and what linkedin now is is a a community platform for business. And what what has happened uh, more recently, it's become a little more Facebook in some of its kind of approach, but what you can do on LinkedIn is have conversations with people like you if you're in the business world. You can find jobs on there, you can learn, uh, there's a feed, you can find out what's going on. And I really get a sense of a, a little more of a joined up business community on LinkedIn. I think originally you would have local um, business gatherings and breakfast meetups. And I personally didn't find them very valuable. Um, I find LinkedIn and other places more valuable because there's more people there. Um, you're able to share something, you're able to get feedback. And so, a lot of the first conversations I have with people in teams and organizations is often through LinkedIn. It's not through getting a list of emails and emailing them and hoping that we'll have a good conversation. Uh, LinkedIn is a little more high quality. It's got to a point where you're starting to get in front of really interesting people and you can create a group and a community. I only created the remote sprints group yesterday and we've got 100 people on there so far. And just some of the conversations you can have, uh, I find really valuable. That was Ross Chapman. He's the head of Etch Sprints, a design firm in the UK. And when he says LinkedIn is the place to be, I couldn't agree more. While many people have accounts, very few utilize the full potential of the platform with their updated ability to add videos, links to work of things that you've done, articles that you may have posted in other places, recommendations from people that you've worked with, and most important of all, a conversation sparking headline. Both Twitter and LinkedIn have been absolutely transformational in not only my career journey, but many other people's as well. And if you're wondering just how powerful this can be at any age, let's hear again from Jim, who shares how he used these platforms to make a pivot in his career. The cadence that people can recognize. So one important component of, of building a, a, what I'm going to call a personal brand or a, a marketplace value for any person is that just sharing content or building content casually where there's no sequence or, or, or rhythm to what you're doing is really not going to serve very well. Because it gives you the ability to continually give yourself an excuse to not produce, to not do it. What I found in my own personal situation was that I decided to write, have articles published on Mondays and Wednesdays of every week. So what happened is I'd set aside some certain time on a Sunday and on a, on a Tuesday so I could write an article to then publish it, in my case, 12.05 a.m. in the morning so I can get exposure both in, on the Far East in Europe and, and the U.S. And whatever that cadence is, it's important to keep it so people who are like you, who follow things. And what's great about LinkedIn is LinkedIn gives you the ability through the development of content to find other people like you that have the same interests and will start to follow you 
and you'll start to follow them and you work as a group that's very personalized and very customized. And in some cases, even geolocationally similar so that you can build even more content from this. And, and, and people have to remember, this content doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be entirely unique to, to the marketplace. You can write about other people's perspectives and give your slant to it. If there's one piece of consistent advice that's been given out by the guests on the podcast, it's the importance of being on LinkedIn. Almost every single guest has mentioned it not only as a platform to connect with others, but really a platform to be able to share who you are as well. One of the other big themes that's come up is the importance of learning and unlearning in a rapidly changing world. Now, when we experience change, we see the things that are taken away, whether it's jobs that we're familiar with and, you know, we feel all the negative aspects. But one of the things that I really like that Ross highlighted in his conversation with me was the idea that the world of work is ripe for disruption and why there's reason to be more optimistic about what's possible in your future. More, more now than ever, the world of work actually needs new people to come in. Uh, whether that's uh, any age, any background, anything whatever, it is ripe for disruption. So don't feel like you're leaving your personality at the door. Don't feel like um, the hours that you spend on TikTok or uh, the activities like sewing or uh, calligraphy or anything outside of work don't apply inside work. It so does. And if anything, certainly in, in marketing and, and in business and strategy as well, if you know what's going on in the world, you have a superpower. Uh, you are bringing the business closer to their customers or whoever relies upon them. So don't discount who you are, bring that to work. You may need to kind of adjust, but that's all part of growing and learning and uh, becoming uh, a, a well-rounded person. But yeah, bring your personality in. Learn the principles, learn the techniques and the kind of um, the, the activities that go along with work. But please do when you start to get a little bit of confidence. And by the way, these things take time. It took me a long time to work out my purpose and where I best work and who I need to work with. I found that I need to be close to leaders and I need to have some autonomy. I need some control over what I'm working on. Uh, so this all takes time, but just start, make a start and just keep on learning, keep on being open and enjoy the journey. I feel like it's important at this point to share a little bit about my own story. The difference that I experienced from graduating in 2007 versus 2020 and why I so deeply believe that the advice that my guests share and what I'm sharing is possible for you as well. Too many of us are familiar with the storyline that's still sold today. The one where you go to school, you do what you're told, and at the end you'll graduate and be on your way to success. As Seth Godin points out in his book, Lynchpin, that storyline expired in 2008. And that was the year that I graduated with my master's and my teaching credential, ready to go and take on my first year as a history teacher. I started with this really fantastic job in a dream school. And for a moment there, I actually thought that that storyline was real. However, by the end of the year, I had my first layoff notice, the first of many that I would get over the next five years as I really struggled to find my place as a teacher in the public education system. In reading Lynchpin by Seth Godin, I slowly began learning the two things that no one in school ever taught me. Number one, what value do I bring to the table? What makes me unique? And number two, once I know what those things are, how do I communicate and market that to others so that I can be found? The moment I realized that, from there, instead of applying to jobs, I was offered jobs because of the work that I was not only doing, but the fact that I was sharing it with the world. Through connecting with people who inspired me and through the sharing of my work, 
I was able to go from looking for jobs on a job board to working with organizations whose mission and values aligned with my purpose. Now, if you're thinking, well, my challenges are too big to overcome and my situation is different, I invite you into my conversation with Julia McCoy. Julia escaped a cult when she was younger and went on to find a multi-million dollar content agency. Her story is sure to change your mind, regardless of what your situation is, and show you how it is in fact your adversities that can become the fuel you need to redirect your path. I'm excited because Julia is actually writing about this topic in more depth in her new upcoming book, Skip the Degree, Save the Tuition. Let's hear from Julia. Well, it's it's funny for me because, um, you know, my my start in life, my first years of life were so hard. The the physical abuse element was really bad and I had a really raw start in life and I think what what happened to my mindset from going through that was <laughs> there's nothing worse than this. So you know what? I might as well try it anyway and become a risk taker. And so that just shaped my mindset to have like no fear of taking risks. And I just carried that. That's one thing I've carried out of that environment. And when you're in a toxic environment and the person that's supposed to love you is doing the very opposite, it kind of... I mean, it can either break you. I've seen it either break people or do what it did to me, which is, you know what? I'm going to follow my passion, not give a crap what anyone thinks because no one loves me anyway, (laughs) as bad as it sounds. Um, So that's kind of what it did to me. It didn't break my spirit. Instead, it encouraged me to be a risk taker. And that's a message I'm sharing in my book is that if um, if that's something you went through, you know, you can celebrate that, embrace that, and use that to fuel risk-taking, which is crazy to think about, right? Because trauma is trauma. But if we turn around and embrace that and say, okay, I'm a strong person and I can go challenge my fears and do all these things and maybe be successful, even though I'm not sure I will be, it's totally worth that risk. Without a doubt, taking the risk is the hardest part. Getting started is the hardest part. But once you do, it is equally as rewarding. Keep in mind, your first try is never your last try. After graduating in 2007, it took me five years to understand the social media landscape and just the change in the economy and how I needed to turn my passion into a skill set that I could market online. I've always silently held a bit of a grudge. As much as I loved my undergraduate and graduate experience at UC Irvine, I always kind of felt a bit slighted. How did none of my professors back in 2007 ever teach me about the importance of marketing my skills? We never once really talked about social media or sharing our work online. And intentionally, how to really build a network. Yes, there's the Student Alumni Association that you always hear about, but really in today's social media landscape, that networking experience goes so much further, yet none of us are really taught how to leverage both the in-person and online network. So when I went back to school in 2018, I was really excited to go back with all of this new knowledge that I had about social media and your passion and how to really shape experiences to your advantage. And while I thoroughly enjoyed my doctoral program experience at the University of Southern California, as I did my undergraduate and master's, it probably comes as no surprise to anyone that very little has changed in how they teach networking or taking your passion and making it marketable from when I was in school back in, 20, back in 2007. And think about that for a moment. That's more than a decade later. 13 years later to be back in school and really have nothing change in that space is one of the things that makes higher education so irrelevant to so many of us today. Despite the ubiquity of social media platforms, I was just so disappointed that no one in any of my classes talked about how to use social platforms to show the world what I as a student could do with what I know. While we hope that COVID accelerates changes in the higher education landscape, We really can't sit around and wait for others to give this to us as an assignment. If I had waited for that, you probably wouldn't be listening to this podcast right now. 
When thinking about how I could share my work, a podcast is one of the many options that I brainstormed. And that's one of the great things about today. There's so many options for how you can share. So if you're willing now to kind of take that risk and get started on LinkedIn, maybe you're nervous about adding people to your network or reaching out to them for advice or questions, or maybe even to interview them for your own podcast or video series or whatever it is that you seek out to do. One of the first people I ever reached out to for my podcast was Duncan Wardle. He's the former vice president of innovation and creativity for Disney. He immediately said yes and later shared this when we had our conversation together. Just a quick disclaimer, you'll notice that the audio in this episode is really, really awful, and it's really just an indicator. Again, that idea that your first try is never your last try, and that everything in life is a learning journey. This was definitely a painful learning journey, but one that always is going to serve as a reminder to me that I'm proud of the fact that I took that risk, that I tried something new, and that I never really could have learned how to make something better unless I had started it to begin with. So anyways, here's Duncan. Well, the other thing, and I think I learned this one from my mother when I was probably six, I replied to everybody. I never, ever, ever ignore uh, a comment, uh, an email, a tweet, ever. That's just rude. If you're that arrogant, piss off the planet and get off. I worked for Disney for 30 years. I ended up a head of innovation creativity, and I would get emails asking me for all sorts of things. If I couldn't help, you'll get a response. My response is, I can't help, but you will get a reply, and I just think that's common courtesy. Now, the audio quality of that clip might have been awful, but the advice is just incredible. And it's incredible no matter where you are in your career, whether you're just starting off as a new graduate or whether you've been in a job and now all of a sudden the future looks really uncertain. One of the things though that Jim reminds us of is the importance of putting in that consistency and that effort in being optimistic when we are either starting or pivoting career paths in today's world. This, we have an amazing world, an amazing country, where at any time you can change the direction of your life based on your passion for going in a different direction. Now, it doesn't mean it's easy by any means, but what it means is it's a whole lot easier if you like where you're going than, than if you don't. And and you know, I think it's important. And as I said, with every age, because I. Not only speak to bankers, but I've spoken to high school. I've spoken to high school students. I've spoken to college, universities, classes, and talked about the impact of not only take, taking on and building your own brand, but more importantly, making sure that your transformation process is something that number one, you're passionate about, and number two, you put the effort to show commitment to. Because without those two things, you will fail. To share a little bit about just how challenging it can be to start something new and really the effort and consistency that it takes, but also the reward and payout that comes out of that work, I want to bring you back to a conversation I had early in the podcast with Matthew Manos, an assistant dean and professor at the Iovine and Young Academy at the University of Southern California. He's also an award-winning design strategist and founder and managing director of his own company called Very Nice. Matthew shares with us what it was like to self-teach himself a skill and then go on to start a business. Yeah, you know, I've always been a very curious person, and I think that that's led to feeling, um, you know, comfortable with self-teaching. When I first, you know, started kind of looking into design, I had been very interested in art. So I had been doing a lot of painting. That was particularly uh, the thing I was kind of specializing in back then. And so as a result, you know, I had this kind of understanding of color and composition and and things like that from an earlier age, just through practice and art classes and, and things like that. Um, And when I was eventually sent a copy of Photoshop from my godmother, uh, she was studying art at the time and kind of sent me a floppy disk, basically. Um, I, right before that moment, was very, uh, pretty much computer illiterate. You know, I I mean, granted, this was in the early 2000s, so it's, it's not like 
you know, everybody was coding when they were five years old, like they are now. Um, but you know, I knew Microsoft Word and that was it. So what I would do, and, and you're right, there weren't really tutorials or anything like that. I just would kind of upload a photo in there and just spend hours messing with it and adding text and just kind of getting to know the tool, um, which I thought was, was the best way that I could go about it. Um, funny enough was starting a business too. You know, I went to, I ended up going to design school for undergrad and grad school. Um, but when I was in design school, I, I, I never took any business classes. I actually still have never taken any business classes. And in some ways, that's probably why I ended up with such a seemingly impractical business, um, because everything about very nice on paper shouldn't work uh, at all. And but, you know, we were kind of at the very early stages of this gig economy that was really brewing uh, around that time. This was around 2008. And that's really kind of sparked by the recession and people just needing jobs, whatever they might be. Uh, and so, you know, you see more and more freelancers at that time, and that continues to grow. And, you know, I really thought, well, it kind of makes a lot of sense to not necessarily have a, a dedicated team, but just partner with people that are in this kind of alternative economy here and there. And, you know, just really learned as I went. I mean, like many people, uh, I had a client that didn't pay me. I had, and I learned oh, you should have contracts. Um, I, I mean, you know, you just kind of learn these things as you go, which led to like a slower development for the company. But I think um, I wouldn't have done it any other way if I could go back. Yeah. Matthew highlights three really important things for us in that story. First, he highlights the importance of doing what you love and also the importance of putting in that consistency and effort towards that skill. The second thing he shares is the opportunities that are possible in times of recession and how he actually leveraged the recession to build his business. And last but not least, number three, that this work is never easy. It's another theme that's come about on the podcast over and over again, that yes, all these things are possible, but don't forget, it is definitely a lot of hard work and a lot of effort. But like Matthew says, he wouldn't have it any other way. Now, another possible scenario that many of us are facing is the uncertainty within organizations that we may have been at for one, two, maybe 10 plus years. And within that organization, perhaps you have an idea or you have a unique skill set that you feel could help solve a challenge that you're currently seeing, or maybe there's an opportunity within your organization that you feel isn't fully being realized. If that's your scenario, then this advice from Douglas Ferguson, who's the CEO of Voltage Control and works with teams to innovate and to help companies realize their full potential, and is also the author of a book called Start Within, is going to share three things that people can do if they have an idea and they want to advance it within their organization. Yeah, I think the 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 first thing is to to go do some. Uh, you can build a lot of confidence by doing some ethnographic research. So you know, talking to people who you think have the the problem that are impacted by the problem, and just getting really curious. So the the thing is, is like I really hate the word buy in, and I think that a lot of people are in this mindset that they need to go sell their idea. I think instead. You want to um, you want to learn about the the context that your idea would live inside and who will be impacted by that idea. You want to really understand who your opposers are. That's number two, because a lot of times when we are infatuated with our ideas, which we have to be if we're going to spend the effort to um, to go do the this work, then we have to be in love with our idea. And if we're in love with our idea, we're going to be blinded to all the, th- the deficiencies of the idea or who, or like if someone were to hate our idea, wh- why do they hate it? And so let's go find out who our haters are and let's understand them really well because um, they're going to be really critical in our journey to, to pushing our idea forward. Um, and uh, also, also I think really thinking uh, uh, a lot about your manager because especially in large organizations, you've got a lot, we call it the frozen middle. Those managers are really about operational efficiency and making sure that things are repeatable and done well and consistently. 
And uh, when you introduce new ways of doing things, you have to disrupt that. And so a lot of times managers will fight this kind of stuff, right, or shut it down. And um, so understanding uh, where your shared values are with your manager and like what about your idea gets them excited um, and you can do that kind of work. Um, I think if you can do that, get to the understanding without pitching it, then you're much better off because if you, if you, you, a lot of times people come in with guns blazing, pitch their idea, and then they've kind of already, you know, you can't really come back after that, right? If, if the manager's already made an impression and decision on what it is, it's, it's a lot harder to repair versus if you're starting to like, like poke around it and learn more and color in your, your context before you actually present it. Um, that, those would be my three. I re-listened to these episodes and this advice so many times, and I hope you found these short excerpts to be helpful. As you reflect on your story, your ideas, your skills, and what makes you unique, remember that the world isn't only changing for you, it's changing for every business out there as well. I'll take us back to something that Ross shared earlier, the world of work is ripe for disruption. The quote that I refer back to and the one that really sort of started this journey for me just to redefine myself and my role in today's world of work is one by Seth Godin from the book Lynchpin. Here's what he says. The job is what you do when you are told what to do. The job is showing up at the factory, following instructions and meeting specifications and being managed. Someone can always do your job a little better, a little faster, or a little cheaper than you can. The job might be difficult, it might require skill, but at the end of the day, it's just a job. Your art, however, is what you do when no one can tell you exactly how to do it. Your art is the act of taking personal responsibility, challenging the status quo, and changing people. I call the process of doing your art, the work. It's possible to have a job and do the work too. In fact, that's how you become a linchpin. That's how you become indispensable. The job is not the work. Your task now is to identify your art. What makes you unique and what makes you indispensable to those around you? If you've made it this far and are now wondering how to take this advice and get started, I've created a resource guide for you over on my website. The guide focuses in on three questions. And while you could answer them yourselves, I highly recommend that you have someone interview you and ask you the questions. It can be absolutely anyone. It does not matter. The reason for this, though, is how we answer those questions that I've outlined to ourselves and how we would answer them when somebody else asks us will be incredibly different. The one recommendation I do give is as the person interviews you, ask them to take notes for you. Ask them to ask you why at points where they become curious or to ask you any other questions that come up for them. After the three question interview, take the notes that they've curated for you. And in my guide, I share how you can use that information to begin building your LinkedIn headline, your about me summary, and to get started on your way as those questions will help you identify what truly makes you unique in your space. To also learn and share with others, I've started a Facebook group for listeners of the podcast. You can find it at Sprint to Success with Design Thinking, and I've linked it in the show notes as well. These definitely aren't easy times, yet one of the best things we can do for ourselves in times of uncertainty is find an area that we can take control of. And one area you control is your story and how you tell it not only to yourself, but with others as well. I hope you found this week's episode to be helpful, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts, your questions, not just of me, but of the guests on the show as well. It's your turn to join the conversation by sharing what you enjoyed or what questions you still have. In a world where time and attention are so valuable, thank you for choosing to listen and for being a part of our Sprint to Success with Design Thinking community. 